Hey, what's up, my good friend? I think at this point I could just call you like my brother from another mother, man. Like we've gone through so much. It's almost like being through war together. Bill Duff joins <laughs> us again. First podcast guest and hopefully not the last podcast guest. <laughs> so, <laughs> Bill, how you been, man? Good, man. Yeah, it's always good to see you, Jason. And uh, just, you know, living through Omicron like the rest of you. Ugh, it's fucking crazy, man. It's it's bananas. You guys are all vaccinated? I forget maybe you said you were or weren't. Yeah, we, we were. We luckily all got vaccinated before it hit the kids. So um, my littlest one, Josie, she she had it. And then it was just like a couple of days of not feeling great. And then, you know, she bounced back pretty quick. So we were happy that both the girls were vaccinated before they caught it. Are, are you one of those people that are like really polar one side or the other on vaccines? Like my wife was very like, vaccines are horrible. We shouldn't get vaccines. And then we're all getting the, the, the COVID shot. We got talked into it. Uh, you know, I do. I, I did a fair amount of research on it and, um, you know, WHO, CDC, stuff like that. Um, I didn't just run out and get the shot. And, you know, I, I'm an odds guy. I, you know, you, you know, I work for the casinos. So, like, odds are my, my life. So I did the odds. And the odds weren't good for me. You know, 320 pounds, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I'm like, yeah, I should get the shot. <laughs> did you go with uh, Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson Johnson? I ended up getting the Pfizer, but that wasn't by choice. It was just, you know, the first one I could get. Yeah, that's that was the one that we got too. I think I went with Pfizer just because, like, I'm like, well, let's see, Viagra makes is made by Pfizer, and everyone seems to love Viagra. So, all right, let's just roll the dice. I mean, Johnson and Johnson makes a ton of stuff too, but like, I wasn't feeling the band aids. Um, uh, that's the hardest addiction I ever had. Band aid addiction or Viagra? Viagra. Viagra was the hardest addiction yeah. you ever had. No pun intended. There. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. It was harder on my wife. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> you got a friend in me. <laughs> That's funny, man. So, um, yeah, I just want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> some of the behind the scenes stuff because there's so much crazy stuff happened with Human Weapon. And um, today we're talking just about the Thailand episode, which was our pilot episode. And, um, you know, that was something that when we first got the like, you know, the, the, Hey, we're going to, we're going to do this thing and it's going to be human weapon. And it's going to be it. The first one's going to be in, in Thailand and do Muay Thai. Well, it was, it was a really, it was crazy because in the very beginning, like they didn't really know what the show was. Um, as it got on several episodes in, we kind of got feedback from the history channel. Okay. This is what the shows are going to look like. This is what the episodes will be. We, you kind of know, like we can, we can compartmentalize those days, but like in the really beginning, man, like it was like, like we were shooting episodes at one point where we'd fly in, we'd get on the ground, um, we'd, we'd leave for like three weeks at a time, right? Like we'd go to like France, Greece, Israel, bam, 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 and then we'd come back. But we were shooting like five days on the ground. The Thailand one, what was it? How long was, was that, epi that that we shot? We were gone three weeks. For Thailand? Yeah. Were we really? Did we? Yeah. I don't remember. Remember, we, f we flew to Bangkok, and we spent almost a week in Bangkok. Then we went down to Pattaya area, um, and then we did all that kind of the beach scene stuff with the, um, the jet ski, which I refused to, to do very much of. You did more of it than I did. Um, just not real comfortable for a big dude, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and then, I remember someone talking about getting a tattoo on the beach. It never, it never happened. But. It was probably me. I think I was like, at the time, Angelina Jolie had that like, the, the, the Buddhist monks do this thing where you walk in and they're just like, mm, this is what you need. And they like do this, like, it looks like they're like chiseling onto your back. I think Angelina Jolie had it and it was like pretty like rad at the time. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to get one of those. And then, then I was kind of talked out of it because everyone was like, that's cool. But have you seen the sanitary conditions in like a Buddhist monastery that's <laughs> sitting in the middle of the jungle? Maybe not the best way to do stuff. But that's crazy. I didn't think it was three weeks. I felt like it was like 11 or 12 days. Um, that was my first time in Thailand. Yours too? Yeah, yeah, definitely my first time in Thailand. But um, no, I mean, just the, and then remember, we, we did that whole jungle deal where we went to um, the literally the middle of a jungle. I, I still don't know what area of uh, Thailand we were in. I think technically we were in Burma, to be honest with you. And um, that tiny little guy who was serious at all times, uh, for some reason, his name is escaping me, Master or something. Yeah, um, they were all Master something, I think. Yeah. But, uh, you know, totally, totally cool guy. And, and I could get what he was doing. It was more of like of a military uh, form of Muay Thai. But at the same time, you know, we're there as just athletes. You know, we're not military guys. Um, and it, the more military the stuff got, that's usually when I got worried. I'd, I'd start getting concerned when they started talking about 
knives and guns and bombs. I'm like, ah, uh, don't think of, you know, there's a parry for a bomb or a, or a bullet. Yeah, that was like those days were so long shooting because like you know at the beginning of the show you don't really know what the hell it is. So what they're doing is they're they're taping everything. Let's uh, is it going to be more of a travel show? So they got to get a bunch of B roll of us getting on and off stuff and traveling, or is it going to be more of the fights? Is it going to be more of the you know the the beauty shots of Thailand? So like I mean we were filming like twelve hour crazy days and then being stuck in traffic. I remember um, <laughs> two of my biggest takeaways were is I remember wearing this brown shirt and I got all my clothes from uh, from guests at the time. I think they gave us like a stipend, right? And, like we just go and pick out six of the same exact outfits so it looked like we're wearing the same thing throughout the week and people for some reason would think we didn't shower. So like I remember just being like this brown long sleeve shirt and we're in the jungles in Thailand and it's it's 100 degrees with 100% humidity and within five minutes this thing was just drenched and it was just so uncomfortable and just so shitty and like you just couldn't get any like relief from that and then the one kid um remember that that i don't know if he's a pa but he got bit by that brown recluse and we're like in the middle yeah. of nowhere and yeah the australia yeah that was crazy listen i remember telling them he's wearing flip-flops in the jungle and i still remember this to this day all of us have boots and socks on i'm like dude like come on like we're in a jungle and he goes it's all right mate i'm an aussie and i'm like okay uh, fast forward 10 hours and his foot was what that big and, yeah. and bleeding plus uh, I, I felt so bad for the kid yeah that's bananas man that was a that was such a crazy scenario like the the, the one of the, the funniest things i remember is that when you know we're doing the pilot episode we fly into thailand and these are long flights if anyone from the u.s has ever gone to southeast asia especially if you are like uh, bill and you lived at the time on the east coast where i was on the west coast it was a little faster but bill would have to take these you know five or six hour flights then you'd you know have a couple hour layover then you're on another like flight another 10 12 hours i mean you're traveling 15 to 20 hours to go to, to southeast asia um and that's usually at your best not only is your body messed up but the times are messed up so i remember we we get to thailand and uh, they're on their way to the hotel and we're like man you know what like first thing that most people think about when they hear thai is thai massage thai massage right it's like go get a massage it's super cheap or go get a massage and I remember the guys being like you don't want to get a massage at the hotel you want to leave the hotel to get a massage because where you guys are staying is a pretty nice hotel and it's going to be really expensive like it's, it's, they're going to they're going to and I was, that makes sense like you know if you're if you're in new york and you're going to you stay at a nice hotel you're going to spend 60 70 percent more because of the convenience factor and they know that people are there to spend money so we get to the hotel and like remember the the two hour massage was like 17 dollars us <laughs> yeah. i was like super expensive this is the expensive massage <laughs> i what, what do you leave and go spend like pay like you know like here's a here's three dollars for a massage right it's, you know but it's such a luxury over there and when they're living on like you know they don't have the economic means to just go have expendable cash i mean it's it's probably understandably like you know we're not they're not fat rich americans or you know the typical europeans where they can just go throw money at that stuff but that was funny i remember that and i remember when i tipped that you had to like get acclimated to the cultural practices too because like i think i tipped like like 20 bucks or something. And yeah, they, they you made the came, girl cry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, like they like bring back money. They're like, you gave us too much. I'm like, no, it's for, you know, like, like, but then I, I didn't realize that like, there's also something to be said for like, like I think as a, being just a, a generous person, I want to like take care of people like that, you know, and just here, you know, I don't know what the right amount is. Right. But they, um, they were like, you also have to be sensitive to the fact that it, it can be almost insulting. I was like, really? And I guess that that was like a cultural thing too. Like you could technically tip too much and they're like, like that's, it was flaunting or something. I mean, it doesn't I mean, yeah. look. Well, it was, it was like saying you're better than they are. Yeah. You know, what's yeah. funny. This isn't exactly with the Thailand one, but I was always worried about like getting offered a happy ending. Right. Like that's what my, always, <laughs> my, my fear, my fear whenever I left a hotel was that if I went to one of these places, cause that was like a thing we would like, you and I would like pretty, pretty not the happy ending part, but like we would like, <laughs> You know, we're constantly looking to get a massage, right? I mean, like we're we're on flights, we're getting our butts kicked, and we're yeah. usually in Southeast Asia, and you know, it's a, it's a usually a pretty good massage. So um, I remember, like every time I'd go somewhere, like I was always like, okay, I was always like nervous that like this wasn't going to be a I can just let my guard down massage that I was going to get like propositioned for some hanky panky, and that never happened until we were in China for one of the episodes, and like it was like at the hotel, and I was like, I don't even care, I just let's just do it, and then like some some like. 55 60 year old Chinese woman comes up and she's given me a massage and it's one of those massages where like her like forearm bumps it and I'm like okay it was an accident 
And then it's like <laughs> deep inner thigh massage where like the pinky is now like playing with like the twig and berries, you know, it's like, and, um, and I'm like, what is she doing? Then she just goes and just grabs it and goes special massage. And I was like, whoa, no, no special. And then like the, the next, as soon as they know you're not going to get the rub and tug, those massages like rapidly go downhill and it's like your hour becomes nine minutes. And it's like peace, you know? Yeah. I've, I've never been, not even in China. They never, never gave me the question. So I, I assumed it was because they felt like they were rubbing an elephant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you look, you look too stern. You should have smiled more. I think they'd, uh, they'd have taken that as an, as an in, but um, what were some of the, the takeaways that you had from when we first get to Thailand and them like, you, you know, they know that there was some arguing going on with, uh, with the producers and the director at the time, Patty secrets. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I remember, I remember standing out front of the hotel with you where they said, Hey guys, like give us a minute. Right. And Zach and, and Patty, they go off to the side, and I could very plainly hear them arguing about the show and what the show was going to be. And it was kind of at that point where I was like, they don't know what the hell they're doing. Like, they don't know what they want. They have no idea what this is going to be. And, like, why the hell did I come out and do this? Like, that really, it, it just, I kind of, like, turned away from you and walked and, and thought for a minute about, like, maybe I should just book a flight home. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. know, because I didn't know Zach from, from Adam and Patty. I mean, he was just, you know, a former apartheid uh, uh, South African. It, like, dealing with him was like dealing with a Klingon. Like, he was always right no matter what. And yeah. that really, really got him later in the show, especially with those monkeys. Um, I just remember him trying to, you know, direct the monkeys when they told us not to get in between the babies and the adults. And then he stepped in. He's like, no. And they just attacked them like nothing i've ever seen oh my god i totally forgot about those monkeys yeah we went to that yeah i remember that i totally forgot about that man like so we go to La this La like, was the name La of the you you have a memory like a fucking elephant man i don't oh, know and i just you... remembered master priang was the guy who we saw in the jump master priang yes that was the the smaller gentleman yeah. so yeah so like i remember like we started with that sid yang tong and it's like the masters issue the challenge go learn muay thai and in six days go fight a world champion which makes total sense right like, right. <laughs> so it's like they should do that with other things like he, he here's brain surgery go learn how to do it and in six days i want you to go remove an embolism like like go have fun <laughs> it's not That's, gonna work it doesn't work it doesn't work you can't edit around that but um yeah i remember like we go to that that uh, where was that uh, with the monkeys La Paris. La Paris. So we yeah. pull into this like this area, and it's in the U.S. If you want to go see monkeys, you're going to a zoo, or if there's like some sort of a petting feature, it's like a hands-on place, like a farm or something, right? Well, we you're driving into the city, and you just start to see like, oh look, there's a monkey. And then as you get further in, there's a bunch of monkeys. And then by the time we're in like the heart of the city, there's as many monkeys as there are people, and that's crazy to see. You walk outside like I'm a big kid. When I moved to Florida, I walk outside and in t to this day, when I see an iguana, I'm like, an iguana, look, that's cool, you know, and I'm like, to see like dozens of monkeys and they're on cars and they're on the street and they're like, it's like, it, it felt like Planet of the Apes, what were they, macaques? I forget what they were. Yeah, and like the people who were locals, they were so used to the monkeys that it was just like, oh, okay, another monkey. Yeah. And they, it, you know, because the monkeys would steal stuff from them, especially their food during lunch. And I just couldn't imagine living in a place where I went to lunch every day and thought, wow, you know, I'm going to have to battle some monkeys to eat my entire sandwich. Like that, that that's a different kind of lunch. Yeah, I remember when we were, we were filming, I think it was the, the move, like everywhere we went, right? Like we had to meet a master, learn a special move, practice this special move, talk about how amazing it was, and then we'd move on. And it was Honeyman Presents the Ring, and it was this double uppercut thing. And I remember, just remember this is the first time I was like, wow, this is some bullshit. Like, like, I remember thinking, do I, like, what's, do I say this sucks? Do I say this isn't going to work? Like, I mean, how does this work? I don't want to be respectful of their martial art, but I'm like, mm, I don't know if this is, this is the move you're going to teach us to save our asses. Um, has anyone in the history of mankind pulled off the double uppercut that wasn't playing Street Fighter? Uh, what's that one movie, Unk Bak? I think he does it in Unk Bak. That, you know what, I think you're right. Yeah, like memory but like a steel trap. I remember that's the first time that Zach and Pat got really mad at me because he was showing us the move, and I was just like, "This is bullshit," you know. And like the cameras were rolling, and they were like, "No, that was good stuff." And I'm like, "Wait, but wait, this is the History Channel. We're trying to tell the truth here, right?" I was like, "Because that's not going to hurt me at all." Yeah. And Jason's just going to laugh, like this is stupid. Um, but we still want to help it. 
Yeah, well, I remember too, like, there's so, like, we're, we're trying to film this thing, right? And, like, you know, like, this isn't a studio. We're outside, so we're beholden to not only weather, other people, crowds, but now we're beholden to monkeys, and they were a problem. I remember, yeah. like, the monkeys climbing on people, and, like, they want to, at one point, we have a picture, I have a picture somewhere I got to dig out of my old files, and um, we're, like, the, I have like two monkeys like on me. One of them because I was I was giving some of them water out of my bottle. Like and then the mom monkey was not feeling that. It was like hissing at me. While another monkey jumps on my head and is like playing with my like hair gel. I'm like you do not want to get messed up in there. You will lose a hand, man. Like so like and then and then the guy had this slingshot. That was like our defense mechanism from these wild like getting attacked by hundreds of of rabid monkeys. Was he had a slingshot with nothing in it and he would yeah. walk around. He would like fake like. Whoosh, whoosh, and I think that like most of the monkeys were like, whoa, shit. And they got back. But there was this one monkey that was like kept getting closer to me. And I was like, what's plan B? Because this thing is like smart enough to realize you don't have anything in there. And it wants to like bite my face off, man. Like, <laughs> I think they saw you coming. They were like, one of us. One, <laughs> one of us. us. Yeah. Uga, <laughs> uga, one of us. Yeah. Oh, man. So, yeah. So we do that. Like we go to the jungle. We go back. And then I remember like towards the towards the end. Right. But. The initially with human weapon, they were supposed to, they, they were like, we're going to let the masters choose who fights, right? right? Which didn't work out well. We did for the first episode and he picked me, which, you know, look, the Thai people tend to be a smaller, a smaller folk and like you're a humongous human by any uh, measurable metric. So like they were like, we'll go with this guy. And then that happened for the next episode. And then it happened for the next episode. I'm like, oh, we got to slow this down. Like I can't keep getting my ass kicked around the world. It's going to be like, it's just Bill's, Bill's new job is going to be medic. <laughs> hey, I was just like, cha-ching, cha-ching. Yeah. <laughs> Easy money, baby. Go ahead, I, Jason. Uh, yeah, it's all like, you. Like that maniac. Yeah. And, 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 and like, so for me, you know, one of the, the challenges was, especially for the first episode, was, you know, I come from a, a fight background. So when you say, like, you're going to, hey, these are going to be, we're going to make it a fight. I was trying to find some clarity on, is this a fight? Like, how hard are we going? What level do we bring this to? Because, you know, there's, there's you've got, like, a handful of people in the entertainment industry there that have no clue about, like, martial arts outside of what they've seen on TV. I mean, I remember we'd get the scripts, right, for, like, Human Weapon. What happened is we'd go out there, we'd film them. They'd edit them. The History Channel would give us some notes, and they'd come back, and they'd go, okay, here's our voiceover script. Then Bill and I would go to, like, a, a voiceover booth, and we'd read the, like, and then we traveled 14 miles to see the the, the Putang Palace, you know, <laughs> like, or, <laughs> whatever it was. Um, and uh, I, I can see where your mind is, 40 and slip. Oh, yeah, the, Put the Putang Palace. I think mean, there probably is a Putang Palace somewhere, man. Like, Putang is for sure going to be something that that's uh. a real thing. So, like, we, you know, we travel here, we go see this thing, and we do this stuff, and um, and like, there's always a couple of things in there, in there that like drove me crazy. One was like, obviously, the fact that like they would be constantly referring to things wrong uh, because like you'd have some like wet behind the ears intern writing what these martial art moves were, and they'd be calling them incorrectly, and I'd, that would frustrate me. The other thing was is that like I always felt disingenuous for two reasons on the show. The first one being is that I understood that they needed to sell these as, as like these guys are putting themselves in, in peril constantly. They're, they may die at any second. I mean, Ice Road Truckers was on and people were like, yeah, they could fall through the ice and die. And then these guys, and they could get killed. But realistically, right, like that's only one good episode. You die. That's, that's, it's, that's the yeah. season finale, that's the right? The that's the end of the episode, end of the series. So like um, I remember that like they, had the, like they wanted to sell these as like really aggressive fights and especially for the first episode in thailand um i mean this guy is a world champion boxer which ironically he like we've connected several times afterwards like we ran into him again in, in the in the philippines and in, in um singapore and i think he's even in the states now and um like i was like what are we doing here like i i, I don't want to die <laughs> like i was real i was real adamant about this and we're like in the middle of the jungle with like not awesome um, medical treatment readily apparent. It was like an hour away. They had an ambulance there, which I'm sure part of that was just for show. But that also for me was like, that was an indication that we really need to have a dialogue. I'm like, is this guy, because we went to the Lupini Stadium and we yeah. saw that guy get laid out with an elbow. And that was oh, yeah. crazy, crazy aggressive. Well, and then we saw him get pretty much stuffed into the back of a taxi, um, yeah. which like to me was shocking. I, he obviously had neck injuries. You know, he, he, he got hit so hard. And then to just flop him in the back of a taxi and send him off to the hospital, I was just like, good Lord. Like, yeah. this is human uh, human chicken fighting or cock fighting. 
Yeah, that's how I that's how I felt about Lumpini Stadium. Um, not to mention the smell. I'll never, that's the one thing I, I can't ever forget the smell of Lumpini Stadium. It was like human excrement, sweat, blood, and money. It was just awful. so. It's like Vegas. Like Vegas minus the, the uh, glitter. <laughs> like Vegas minus the glitter. <laughs> yeah, I mean everyone. That's like the 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 feather in the cap. Like anyone that does Muay Thai or that's gone over there and, and trained. Like Lumpini Stadium's like. The, the Madison Square Garden, like I've, I've fought finally at Lumpini Stadium, but it's really not like, I mean, um, it's, it's not like a, um, uh, you, you know, we're so lucky in the U.S., right? Like, I mean, our standard of living of poor here is like way better than the average person over there. I mean, and not to get ahead of episodes, but we've traveled to places where people were live, li- still living outside in villages and like tribes-esque. Yeah. I mean, we were on that waterway one time and people were... You know, that's just like, hey, like, we're so lucky that we have readily accessible clean water and we don't have to fight for our food. And like we have yeah. hospitals. And, and that was such an eye opening experience for me. Um, but I remember like so we, we go to this final fight and like I always was like, what are we doing? Is it, and luckily it was cool. It was a sparring session. But they always wanted abilities as he's like, we got to go kill each other. And that was always the concern I had was like, at what level is one of us going to get hurt? Because for sure. Like someone's gonna be like, I'm. I've got an ego. I'm not letting these guys come in from a week of training and kick my butt. And a lot of times, I mean, look, like we we couldn't kick their butts because you know you can't. You can be an amazing bowler, but now you want to go learn darts and play darts for a week. You you know within that skill set, you know a lot of your attributes just don't don't translate. Um, that and I was eating like shit and totally <laughs> out of shape the whole time. So like, and Nick, how many times? Did we did, you, did we get a script for like and we'd be like uh, then they ran we ran nine miles through the jungle but really what happened like we ran past camera six times for twelve feet <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know? well it, it, yeah that that happened a ton and, and then um, I don't know if you remember but when we were training with Master Priang we went to a temple that was built on the side of a mountain and there was a staircase uh, leading up to it and I am not kidding when I say. It was a minimum of 70 degree pitch on that staircase. I remember that. And they were like, all right, guys, you know, go up to the top of the temple and come down. And they sent Paul, uh, our camera guy with us, who was a big guy as well. And we may have made it up uh, one third of the way before we were all like, uh, we're going to die if we go to the top of this thing. Because the, the steps got smaller. And, you know, I got a size 14 foot. And I, I just remember, like, my toes were the only thing fitting on top of these stairs a third of the way up and they were getting smaller and i was just i can't do this like i'm gonna i'm gonna legitimately fall off a hill in thailand and die so that part was for real like yeah we could have died on that but the fights not not so much yeah i remember too like because in the very beginning and that's being the pilot episode and for those of you guys that are listening that don't know what pilots are like the way that basically television gets made is that people pitch a hundred ideas to a network and out of those hundred um ten of them will be good enough to make a pilot where they put money up and they say basically let's see proof of concept and you go out and you film a pilot and it's usually a lot of work and it's a lot of stuff because they're not really sure what what that show should look like they have an idea based on the pitch and then they they edit it and they come back they make changes then they take that pilot <clears throat> and they test it with a, on an audience and they go do you guys like it what don't you like what do you like and assuming it it good tests well they pick it up to series so we shoot this pilot we're you know doing all this stuff and um and uh I forgot where I was going with this. That's what happens when you get hit in the head a lot, man. Like you make, you start making a point and it just goes totally to shit. <laughs> um, but in terms of like, uh, you know, the, oh, that was, what I was saying one of the things that, that I remember the first inclination that I had, and I'm, I wasn't a fan of, of, uh, Patty secrets. Patty secrets is what we, uh, non-affectionately called our director for the first few episodes because he was just, um, he just didn't have great people skills. We'll leave it at that. But I remember him, you know, like, really trying to like ramp up you and tell you like, you know, eh, tell him you're going to grip him up and what are you going to do to him? And they like, you know, kind of oh, trying to like get us to like talk shit. And I was like, this is so disingenuous. Like I'm here as a martial artist. I want to learn this stuff. I'm competitive, but I'm not going to like sit there and like, you know, uh, try to tell him, well, you're going to give him a forearm shiver. You're going to do that. <laughs> like, you're going like, so to spike him on his little head or something. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. The dude knew nothing about athletics, let alone martial arts. Yeah. I mean, we, we would get out of a van. He'd be like, all right, guys, go get in there. I'm like, I'm going to stretch. I'm sure Jason's going to stretch. Like, I'm going to actually get ready. We just traveled two hours in a, in a tiny van that, that I, you had to push me into to fit. So, Down by the river. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give it a minute, Patty. Yeah. And the reason we called him Patty Secrets is because every time he talked to you one-on-one, 
he'd pull you aside and act like it was a secret. And like, and it would be about the most mundane crap. Like, okay, okay, Bill, we're gonna do this. And I need you to really wrangle Jason on this and keep it serious. I'd be like, don't you realize the fun part of the show is gonna be when we have fun doing the show? And they never showed that on the show, which is my biggest regret of the show, is that they never showed our funny parts, the part where we screwed up, you know, and it was just, it was a really good time, but the show came across as serious as a heart attack, and I think that pretty much what killed the show, to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, I was always um, under the impression, in my understanding, was that, because I knew that there were issues with the History Channel getting, the, 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 the consensus I heard from the production company was, they took forever, I mean, it was like several months, we, we shoot this pilot, and then we don't hear anything for months and months and months, and like every, you know, four, five, six, seven weeks, my manager at the time, they'd, we'd get a ping from um, Jupiter Entertainment, which was the production company, and they would say, hey, you know, they still love it. They just don't know. They're not positive. They're just working some stuff out, looking good. And we didn't hear anything for a long time. And then when we finally heard it, they are like, we love it. And instead of like six episodes or 12, they're like, let's do 20 freaking episodes or whatever. And then the, the History Channel was, under my understanding was that they were like, slow in getting it done, and then they wanted everything immediately, immediately. And the problem was with Jupiter that when they were – uh, they weren't getting things cut and edited and back to them and the rough cuts and the fine cuffs quickly enough. So what would happen is we'd say, hey, there's a new episode. And I know that for sure this happened. They would say, there's going to be a new episode Thursday, 10 p.m., karate. And then the episode, and then, you know, because they're, they're doing lead time on that, you know, 8, 10, 12 weeks out where they're selling ad spaces. They're, that's how they're making their revenue. And then there would not be a new episode. They wouldn't have, they, the production company didn't get it to them in time. So they'd have to show like, damn, do we do like a highlight show? What do we do? We just, they just throw on an old episode. And people were like, oh, this fucking says new episode. It's an old episode. So that just has like a trickle down effect because I remember distinctly every, you know, whenever the shows would come out and we'd find, find out the ratings, it was always like us and Ice Road Truckers were like one and two. And, and truthfully, Ice Road Truckers, you know, you can turn it on and not have to think too hard. It, it usually was like 60-40. Ice Road Truckers would pull ahead, no pun intended. Um, but it's very rare that you would see the number one or number two show on a network not get renewed for additional seasons. Yeah, I, you know, that was also when the bubble burst too, though. Remember that. So 07, 08 is when we went to that deep recession. And we were not a cheap show. And I can't imagine Ice Road Truckers was a cheap show either. Um, well, they were paying us cheap. If that, like, no, they they definitely our, paid, got away with that. Yeah, I'm like, was um, our was I'm like, was was our pay a uh, percentage of the the gross uh, episode fee? Because I'm guessing it was like point zero 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 one of like it was basically. I remember before we even did this, just to get back into like the idea of like how they wanted to make it feel so aggressive is like before we like signed on the dotted line. I remember one of the things they were like, well, you guys might have to like sleep in tents outdoors and all this is really was in the beginning really pitched as like an aggressive survivor-esque reality show but it kind of morphed into more of a hosted try to get information across and you know the this being the pilot the history channel was always like the civil war channel so this was their one of their flagship shows this and ice road truckers that they were going to put a lot of time effort money and pr uh, pr behind to try to bring in that younger cooler audience that's going to be sitting around to watch those world war ii documentaries down the road um you know, so it was this 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 new kind of thing for them, and um, you know, like the the Thailand episode for me, the biggest takeaway was, fuck a duck, man. <laughs> this is a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, if you would have separated out hourly what we got paid, Jason, I, I estimated at about seven dollars and twenty five cents. Seven twenty five, about three fifty. About yeah, no, it was it was not. I did not do it for the money. I'm going to be a hundred percent honest. I yeah. did it for the experience myself. Um, you can always go get a job and make more money. Uh, I'm a dude. I need a, I need a chair and a TV and some food. I'm good to go. Um, you know, money to me is, uh, it's an unattainable goal, right? Cause it's, uh, numbers are never ending. They go on forever. So if that's the, if that's the end goal for your life, you're going to be chasing for the rest of your life. Yeah. Um, I, I'm an experienced guy. I've always been an experienced guy. I love the experience we, we shared together. I look back on it with nothing but fond memories. And um, Thailand still stays with me because, funny enough, my brother uh, wound up marrying a Thai national. And my, my nephew, who's now 12 years old, his name's Declan, um, love him to death, such a great kid. Uh, you know, he's half Thai. So, um, you know, we still talk about Thailand a lot. And she goes back home. And, um, it, it's just, it, Thailand is, 
a lot of people don't know, it's called the City of Smiles, right? Or the Land of Smiles. People there are awesome. They'll literally give you the shirt off their back. It's just such a good culture of people and and they want to do right and they, they want you to have fun while you're there. They want you to bring people back over. That's that's the one of the biggest things we've missed about Thailand. Yeah, we're there for martial arts, but we're also kind of ambassadors, right? The History Channel. Like it didn't show any of when we went to the karaoke bars and when I jumped off on stage with that live band. I don't know if you remember that and started doing the Blues Brothers song. But like, I remember that as one of my favorite times of doing the show. Like when we would go out and just have a good time. I don't remember if it was Thailand or the Philippines, but I distinctly remember there was like, I think it was in Pattaya. There was that, that like, I don't say red light district, but it was like all the bars, right? We're in one area. Was that, I don't know if that's Philippines or Thailand. And uh, I remember being at a urinal and, um, you know, using the urinal and someone comes behind me and starts massaging my neck. <laughs> while I'm taking a whiz and then he's I turned around and I said no no and like puts like he puts like a cold towel he, he was basically the bathroom attendant and I guess it's very normal there it's like a, hey I'm we're just you know hey I'm here to service you and make a tip and here's like cool you off because th- these these were like outdoor indoor um, um facilities and it was just hot and kind of humid and you're you're constantly sweating and the humidity yeah. is just insane over there but that's the that was and the one of these were like you need to like think about this, man. Like when I got my uh, my hoo ha in my hand, <laughs> and you, somebody comes up behind me at a urinal, give, me a and warning. Starts, <laughs> give you a little yeah. Like maybe start with the cold rag on the forehead or something. Like you know, don't <laughs> let's not go backwards into that. But but that was a fun episode, man. And then I remember like you know we didn't hear anything for so long, and that was just at the time I was like, well, maybe this is just a one off, and. And then, and then in the meantime, I think you know this. Like uh, I was still like trying to make ends meet fighting, so um, I had gotten a contract with the UFC to fight UFC 60 Spencer Fisher, which was the Matt, uh, Matt Hughes Hoist Gracie card. And at the time, that felt like yeah, I'm making it as a fighter. And, and full disclosure, I never wanted that to be a career. That was just like a, a hobby that would pay the bills. And then eventually, that hobby became you know, um, a bigger opportunity. And I remember asking Joe Rogan, I was like, man, like when the show got picked up, I was like, oh, they they naturally right like five months of nothing you get a UFC contract two weeks later hey you guys come on the show's getting picked up I remember asking Joe like man what do I do like I because I know Joe was a big um he was a big vocal piece in in Joe Silva's ear and so was Eddie Bravo about like getting me the opportunity and um, I didn't want to let anybody down and he was like man if you don't have to fight don't fight and especially back then when the contracts were two and two two thousand dollars to fight two thousand dollars to win you got to pay your own medicals you got to fly out your second cornerman and stuff and like you could you could like fight a world beater and just die and and <laughs> still be losing money so so i remember you know having to make that phone call to joe silva but um you know like you said it was such a great experience because you know there was effectively for all the episodes you and i and then our extended family would be the director there'd be a producer for the episodes. There was three or four producers because you'd have to do pre-production planning, the actual hands-on production, and then the post-production. And the same producer would oversee all three facets of it. And, um, you know, we even had some young producers, like kids in their early 20s to take on that. But, you know, it was, uh, it was uh, our, our, our two camera guys. Um, so, oh, what, oh, my gosh. Paul and Eric. Paul and Eric. Eric, yeah, it was Paul, Eric. We had our audio cat. Um, Bravo. Yeah, Bravo, Bravo. Adriano Bravo. Adriano Bravo. He has such a great memory, man. And then, um, you know, it would be the director. Now, so we'd always be traveling around. Then we'd hire local people. But it really is. <clears throat> and this isn't in any – this isn't really a, an apt comparison because I don't want to to um, downplay the, the, the camaraderie that the military have. But it, it, the best way I can liken it was it was like being in the military. Like you go through these experiences together uh, away from home – that are very much like this is your band of brothers and you're kind of in it together. And like, really there was a lot of times where like you and I were the only ones looking out for each other. <laughs> like we'd have to kind of be yeah, no doubt. A, a unified force on stuff. And then that also would help with the production stuff too. But <laughs> if you could go back um, and just speaking specifically on the, the Muay Thai episode, if, if you could, uh, well, that's because of the series as a whole, if you could change one thing about the way the show was, what would it be? Oh, it would definitely be to be uh, more on our dialogue and our experience through it, whether it was funny or whether it was serious or any of that type of stuff. Like the stand up hosting stuff to me is so fake, so stupid. It's that's not the experience. But, you know, as we're as we're learning, let's say, uh, you know, we're learning a teep, which is just that front kick and everyone calls it something different. And to be honest, I wasn't that good at it. Right. Like as we started, because think about a football player and and throwing a teep out. It's it's almost everything against what football players get taught. 
right? You're, you're bringing your hips high, you're throwing your leg out, you're taking your upper body and you're thrusting it backwards to create force forward. And the first couple of times, I, I don't think I did a good job. And you were kind of laughing and I was laughing and that big Dutch guy that was at um, Tiger Muay Thai, I think it was. Yeah, he was laughing too. And it, it was a funny moment. It was a good moment. And they, that was gold. They should have used that. They yeah. really should have because like, yeah, I'm not going to do great in Muay Thai. I was 300 pounds, six foot four, old football player and wrestler. Like show that, show some of the stuff where we screwed, you know, kind of screwed the pooch. Um, I just, I don't think there was enough of that. And it, there wasn't enough of, of your jokes and me laughing at them. And I, that would have, that would have been a much better show to me. Oh man, it's, you, yeah. there's so much that like, this is funny. Like, I think we've overcorrected so much. Like there's, you know, where does that fine line end of like respect? And now we're just getting a little crazy. Like everyone's feelings have to be placated too. I think the guy that was the, um, that directed the hangover, uh, he's like, I'm not doing comedies anymore because it's, you can't, you can't do a comedy. Like comedy was supposed to be stand up, and I have a tremendous amount of friends that do stand up. And, and, um, you know, I think I've done stand up a couple of times. And one of the challenges is like being a sentient person and like, my sense of humor is definitely snarky and, and, and I'll make fun of myself too. Um, but like, where does that line lie that you gotta be so worried about everyone's, um, how everyone feels like comedy should be, everyone doesn't have the same sense of humor. That's what I think is great about comedy. It should be a safe place to poke fun at everything that's from religion to sex, race, creed, and just in, in the spirit of like, let's all learn to laugh a little bit more. And then yeah, everyone's, you know, upset and crying. So it's crazy that the world we live in, man, but maybe, um, Maybe COVID changes all that. I don't know. <laughs> well, no, I see. I see it pushing it towards the other way of people hypersensitivity to things and you know wanting to be a victim. I've never wanted to be a victim in my entire life. Uh, I look for reasons not to complain. You know, people who complain about things and offer no solution—that's just whining. Yeah. And that type of mentality is seen as toxic now. And I just I can't wrap my head around that because. I've been nothing but successful through my entire life with that line of thinking. And it, it, it almost depresses me when I think that the next generation won't be, I don't want to say as tough, but uh, as thick skinned as we were. Yeah, you took the words out of my mouth. Yeah, no, I think so. And I think that like the every generation uh, probably feels like the next generation, even going back hundreds of years, is like the not as tough generation because every generation does. Um, to some capacity have it easier, at least in a physical sense. You don't have to like walk 10 miles uphill to school anymore for the most part, right? Like we've got public transportation and clean water and we didn't have to worry about where's our next meal coming from. And, um, but you know, as we move from the industrial revolution to like the technological revolution and the internet and stuff, but I just think we've really just, we've just massively overcorrected. And, and I want to see if this pendulum is going to swing back the other way. Cause you know, um, you know, they're getting really off topic, but like I had uh, Brian Callen on, he's like, Dave Chappelle is a hero because Dave Chappelle got so much shit for that, that stand up special of his, um, you know, where he was just, you know, and when, before I watched it, I had heard all the criticism of Dave Chappelle for that from the uh, LGBTQT, um, I might be missing some abbreviations, uh, community. And I was really expecting it to be aggressive and overboard. And when I watched it, I was like, man, maybe I'm, a, I'm an asshole, but like, this doesn't seem that bad. This was just him talking about his perspective and how he sees things and, and his own experiences. There's a big difference between standing up for something you believe in and expressing your, your, your truisms and putting down other people. Like, I hate the expectation now that you have to do all these things. You have to like, you know, you, you have to make sure that everyone in the room is okay with everything you're gonna say. You have to make sure that you're dotting I's, crossing the T's. It just, it, it's like our civil liberties and our brains are getting like confined in this smaller space. I agree. That's my rant. Well, I appreciate you coming on, brother. And um, no, thanks for having I'm, me. I'm sure I'll talk you. to you. I'm sure I'll talk yep. to you before you come down here. But uh, I look forward to seeing you and the wife and send my love. Awesome. Thanks, brother. Take it easy, man.